Hello everyone. Welcome to the second lecture of the third module, which is on DRAM or dynamic RAM. The disclaimers remain the same. So we were studying about DRAM. So we were studying about this DRAM, which you know kind of forms around 50 to 55 percent of this memory market. Why is it called a DRAM? Or why dynamic? Because data is stored in the form of charge on a capacitor. And the charge may leak because of these access transistors leakage. And because just because of that leakage, we have to do what? Refresh. So what exactly is refresh? The charge on that capacitor needs to be replenished and for that, what we do is we first read the state and then write it back. Okay, so we were looking at different flavors of this DRAM. So first we looked at this 3D DRAM cell, which is shown on the right, this 3D DRAM, which was the first commercial DRAM chip coming from Intel in 1970. So if you look at its structure, it's very close to you know what we had in 8TS RAM cell. So, so 3D DRAM as we saw has two word lines, one each for read and write. Then it has got two bit lines, one which facilitates read and one which facilitates write. So it's very close to the structure of that 8TS RAM cell that we saw where your read and write were decoupled. And therefore it was giving you a non-destructive read. And we also saw that when we have to write anything to this cell, what we do is we simply turn on this, we simply put the data on this BL1. So BL1 is kind of, you know, the write bit line. We put the data on it. Data to be written is put on it. Then what we do, we bootstrap your write word line and then it charges or discharges this internal capacitor CS. So what exactly is CS? CS is intrinsic cap, which that node sees. So intrinsic cap, which node X sees. What are the different components of this CS? So CS consists of, you know, your mainly your CGG of M2. And there are parasitics coming from, you know, wire and also coming from your transistor M1 and also together they form this intrinsic capacitor CS and we told that it is intrinsic. We do not need to add an external capacitor like the case of 1T1C in that. Okay. Another thing, this was for write. Now how we read it? So reading process is similar to ATSM. So for reading, first what we do is we pre-charge our BL2, which is kind of, which I call as the read bit line to be read. And then what we do, then we bootstrap the read bit line, read word line. So once we do that, your M3 turns on, right? So once we do that, this M3 turns on. So we have, and then depending upon the node voltage of X, like whether it was charged to VDD during the write, or whether it was charged to ground, or whether it was discharged to ground during the write process, your M2 conducts, or it doesn't conduct. So if your VX was charged to VDD, then M2 will conduct, and once that once it does. You have a path for this discharge of whatever load capacitor was there at this BL2, CBL2. You have a discharge path to ground. So the output that you see is, or the output that you read is zero. This is your read output. And if it was ground, then M2 is turned off. And when M2 is turned off, the output remains at VDD. 
So what output you need is a one. Since if your node X is charged to VDD, you need a zero. And if it is discharged to ground, you need a one. This kind of 3D DRAM is an inverting cell. Although this 3D DRAM is kind of promising because you know it only consists of three transistors, but still you have two word lines and two bit lines we have to be which have to be routed. So routing complexity is here. And it can be further minimized by you know combining these two word lines and these two bit lines and eliminating two more transistors. So that is what was done in this 1T1C architecture, which kind of you know transformed the entire DRAM industry. So this 1T1C has got only one transistor, one word line, and one bit line. And you read and write using the same word line, uh, word line and bit line pairs. So what you do during write is, you simply, for write, what you do is, you apply voltage corresponding to the data to, the, to be written. Apply voltage, uh, corresponding to the data to be written and then you assert your word line high. So you uh, apply a voltage corresponding to the data to be written where on bit line and you apply VDD for one and ground or zero. Okay. And then you assert your word line high, and then correspondingly, CS will charge to VDD or discharge to ground. However, here, one fundamental difference as compared to 3D RAM is your CS is extrinsic gap. So it's not something that is composed of, you know, the internal. Uh, node capacitances that your terminal, this terminal, let us call this X over here as well. So this terminal X, it's not the intrinsic cap which that node X sees. Here we have extrinsic cap and the properties of extrinsic cap should be that first, it should be monolithically integrated. So it should be compatible with monolithic integration. And the second property should be, it should be having a high value but requiring a low area for density basically. And the most common, we saw that the most common or the modern DRAM cells use something which is called the trench capacitor. So they kind of dig holes in the substrate and by that what they do is they kind of maximize your area. So they simply maximize area of this gap. Okay. Then how do we read this cell? So for read what we do is we pre-charge the bit line to only VDD by 2. This is something that you should definitely understand. So we pre-charge it to only VDD by 2 and then what we do is we again bootstrap our word line high. And once we do that, what happens is this node CS and CBL kind of form a charge sharing kind of, so the circuit here uh, looks something like this. So you have this CBL, then you have this, which is connected now because your word line is turned, word line is bootstrapped and you have this CS, which is here. And they kind of charge to a common potential VC. And we saw that this common potential VC is neither ground nor VDD. So this VC is neither ground nor VDD. Therefore, whatever you read would not be any of the real term, like would not be any of the output rates, that is VDD or ground. So here, what we told was that a sense amplifier is required to pull the change in this bit line let's call this del VBL to either ground or VDD 
and then complete the overhead operation. Because the external world is digital and it understands only zeros or ones. So sense amplifier is required here for functionality and not just for accelerating the process as was the case for 3D DRAM or 60S RAM. Okay, with that, we also saw that this change in the VBL, this gel VBL is proportional to your ratio of CS by CS plus CBL. So this is what we call charge transfer ratio. So here you can see that CS plays a major role. Larger the CS, larger will be the charge transfer ratio and larger would be this del VBL. And that is what we want. So that is why we want a capacitor which is having a high value. Okay. Also, because of this charge sharing, what happens is CS leaks charge to CBL. Or I would say uh, the charge on CS changes during read. So this implies that read is destructive. Now, once the read is destructive, what is more stringent here is your refresh is more stringent. I mean, it's required after every read process. And how basically they do it, the first, so you have a sense amplifier over here, let's draw it like this. You have a sense amplifier, let us say like this. So they read the state and then again apply this output to this period and write back this value to CS. So first they read it, they read the value. The sense amplifier gives you some real to real output and then sense amplifier output is applied to bit line. and write is performed during refresh. So what happens is whatever charge was extracted from the CS or kind of deposited on it, it gets back to its original form. So this was something that we discussed in the last lecture. We also saw that, you know, here since you have only one bit line, unlike uh, SRAM cell where you had bit line and bit line bar, and your sense amplifiers are usually what? Your sense amplifiers are usually some differential amplifiers, diff amps, or you know, your sense amplifiers are some latches, like the bistable element, which is biased in its metastable point. So those differential amplifiers or even bistable elements work with two inputs, right? So the sense amplifiers work with two inputs. However, here, since you have only one bit line, you can only feed one input to the uh, one input to sense amplifier, sense amplifier. So here, the sense amplifier should be designed in such a way that it kind of you know uh, takes into account only one input and then uh, provides you a ground or VDD or uh, or latches the output at one of those output rails that is VDD or ground. So first, we need to see what is this single-ended sensing. So the most primitive way for single-ended sensing is something which is known as you know a charge redistribution amplifier so this is still used in some you know very small memories i would say uh, very small capacity memories so before I get into the operation of this, you know, charge redistribution amplifier, I thought that I would first discuss this NMOS as a pass transistor. I have been assuming that you guys know it, but I'll just, you know, uh, revise upon it. So let's call this as M1. This is, let's say, VDD is applied to its gate terminal. And let's call this node X so that its voltage is Vx. Okay. So once this is VDD, and let's call this node capacitor Cx. So once you once you turn on or once you you know apply a voltage VDD on the gate of this NMOS, which is kind of acting as a pass transistor over here, what happens is your VX, what will be the voltage at which VX kind of uh, like CX, VX 
So the moment you apply this voltage VDD on its uh, drain terminal and VDD on its gate terminal, your CX kind of charges to a value VX and that voltage VX is nothing but VDD minus VTH. Why so? Because the moment VX increases beyond VDD minus VTH, your effective VGS of the transistor, which is VG minus VS, kind of goes below this VTH and we say that M1 turns off and this node Vx or this capacitor Cx is not charged beyond this value which is Vdt minus Vth. However, this is the case when you know you are talking about some instantaneous time frame or your time frame at which you are looking at these outputs is in some picoseconds to nanoseconds. However, if you look at at t equals to infinity what happens? So in that case what will happen is even if your VGS is less than VTH you may be aware that there is something which is called a sub threshold current which flows through a MOSFET, right? And once it will flow, it will again charge the CX, right? So at T equals to infinity, because of this sub-threshold current, what you have is your VX can reach even VDD. However, this is the case only at T equals to infinity. So these are the conditions for different time frames in MOSFET. So with that discussion, let us come back to our discussion on this charge, redistribu uh, charge redistribution amplifier. So charge redistribution amplifier basically works on the principle of imbalance in the charge sharing process between a small cap and a large cap. So the large cap tends to, you know, uh, pin the voltage of this system at the voltage that it was pre charged So we'll get to know that in a while and when I analyze it. So how it works is the C large can be, you know, your CPL and the C small can be any external cap which you have added for amplification purposes. And here you may have, you know, your entire DRAM block or something. You may have your DRAM blocks something like this. So this C large may represent a bit line capacitor. Okay, anyways. So how we basically works is you apply first a VDD on this VS and you apply some V reference on the gate of this transistor M. So what would be the potential at this VL? So VL will be charged to V ref minus VTH of this M1, right? Because after that, this M1 will kind of turn off. Okay. Now you have your C large charged to this VF minus VTH potential. And let's say we kind of, you know, apply a word line high on some, some of the DRAM. We applied a word line high on some of the DRAM and somehow it was storing, storing a zero and this bit line voltage kind of reduced by amount, which is let's say VF minus del V. So this del B kind of dropped across this, uh, this del B kind of dropped because of this charge sharing between the DRAM's capacitor and this bit line capacitor, which is kind of C large. Here. So now the situation will look something like this. So if you draw the equivalent circuitry, now the situation looks something like this. So you have this C large, which can be CBL actually. Then you have this C small, and these will be charged to a common potential, let's say this. Right. And let us apply the charge conservation principle. Charge conservation. So applying this charge conservation principle, we have CL, where kind of we represent the C large as CL times this VF minus VTH minus this del V plus this CS times VDD. This has to be equal to, you know, this VC times CS plus CL, right? So therefore your VC will be simply CL times this VREF minus VTH minus this del V plus CS times this VDD divided by CS plus CL. 
now we call this now we know that this c small is very small as compared to c large that is your cs is very small as compared to cl therefore cs times vdd can be neglected as compared to you know the cl times whatever it is so your vc kind of becomes cl times Vf minus Vdh minus del V divided by Cs plus Cl. Similarly, here also the Cs can be neglected in comparison with Cl. So it is equivalent to Vf minus Vdh minus this del V. Now, if you kind of you know compare this Vc with the existing voltage on Cs, which was Vdd. So the change in the voltage on this Cs. Is VDD minus this VC, which is VDD minus VF plus VTH plus this del V. Now usually we choose our VF as VDD by two plus VTH, since we want to you know recharge our kind of this uh, bit line CBL. So we kind of, we want to recharge the CBL to VDD by two. So we select this VF as VDD by two plus VTH. So in that case, the change in this small capacitor is what VDD minus VF, which is VDD by two plus VTH. So it's simply given by VDD by two plus this del V, which is kind of the swing that we obtain during the read process. So you know. The voltage change on this VL was very small; it was minus del V. But because of this charge sharing mechanism, the voltage on this small capacitor changed by an amount which was close to VDD by two plus this del V. So any small change in this VL kind of gets converted to a very large change in this uh, C small, and that is how you are kind of you know amplifying your variations. However, the problem with this charge distribution amplifier is. That it's not very robust to noise. Even if VL changes because of noise or offset, there would be a large drop or large change in this VL small, and that would be reflected in the output. So, how we can convert this large change in this? Uh, v small to you know a rail to rail swing. So we kind of we can add an inverter over here, and if we have an inverter such that its Vm is close to you know Vdd by two. So if the voltage at this changes by let's say Vdd by two plus del V, I mean if it increases by Vdd by two plus del V, it will definitely go to some rail to rail swing. So that is how you can actually uh, convert this. Output of this, you know, charge rate distribution amplifier to some of the rates, and what it does is it kind of you know amplifies any small change in this large capacitor by a large change by a large change on this small capacitor. And the reason for this is this common potential tends to be pinned at the value of that large load capacitor, so it kind of gets pinned to this value, and because of that, there is a huge change in this small capacitor voltage. So that is the main reason behind this. So, despite this simple working principle of this uh, charge redistribution amplifier, noise immunity is something that we require in our circuits. So, in differential amplifier, or you know, even in your bistable latch, since you have two different inputs, if there's a noise which has been injected by the power supply or any other source on both of these terminals, it can be cancelled with the help of that differential configuration. So, it's always better to convert this single-ended thing. To a differential uh, to a differential configuration, and how we do it? Let's say we have this bit line, which is kind of coming out of your DRAM array. Let's say this is one DRAM cell, this is second DRAM cell, and so on. But this is let's say your bit line capacitance here. So what we do is we feed it as one end of a differential sense amplifier. And we compare it with some reference. Now, this way we can actually, you know, uh, 
get immunity to noise. You know, the problem with this V reference is that this V reference kind of changes across a single chip. Why so? Because the bit lines located on the far end of the chip will suffer from interconnect drops. So there is only one pin on the IC which kind of feeds this feed up. So as this signal goes to the far end of this chip or to the BL which is located on the far end or the, to the sense amplifier which is kind of located on the far end of the chip, it kind of degrades because of this interconnect drops. So for that, what you need to reduce this, you need a lot of buffers. Also, because of this process variations, different I across a waveform, this VREF will change for them. Because you know, if you have process variations, you have different interconnect properties. And because of different interconnect properties, even if you apply the same voltage to all of these you know, chips, you will get a different kind of V-reference at different, uh, across different dials. Okay. So you have these problems with this. And the third problem is that whenever you operate any circuit, it heats up, right? There is a current flow, there will be two heating and it will heat up. When it heats up, temperature increases. So with temperature also, your V reference should not change. So how can we provide a V reference which does not change the temperature? So there is something which is called as band gap voltage references and sub band gap voltage references. If you look at any of these band gap or sub band gap voltage reference generators, you'll find that there are two components of this, or there would be two elements. One would be showing you P tact, like the element will have its properties proportional to absolute temperature, absolute temperature or D, let's say. And there would be other element, which would be C tag, which would be like complementary to this absolute temperature. So if you are using a combination of elements, where one shows like an increase of current, depending on the temperature, as your temperature increases, another one is showing a reduction in the current as your temperature increases, they kind of compensate each other. And what you end up with is, you kind of generate a fixed voltage across all the temperatures. So that is the role of this band gap or sub band gap voltage references. So these are very important components of your analog circuitry. Now another like constraint or uh, it would be great if you know your V reference could also track noise on this BL. Noise, it can be noise, it can be offset, DC offset. It can be some uh, DC voltage coming due to parasitic coupling. So it would be great if we can have a provision, or if we can kind of come up with a V reference, such that it can also talk, track that noise, or you know, the DC offset. So an, att an attempt to do that, which is very simple, is shown in the next slide. So what we do is, basically, we have this open bit line architecture. And in this, what we do is, we divide our bit line into two parts. Here, let's say on left hand part we have VLA, and on the right hand side we have VLB. This is the first thing that we do. So, once we are dividing one bit line into two parts, into two bit lines, so what you are effectively doing is you are also reducing the capacitances. So, your C bit line A and C bit line B would be equal and they would be equal to C bit line 
type two, right? If your C bit line was kind of the capacitance of the entire bit line, means they were taken together. So this way, you are also improving your charge transfer ratio, right? And then what you also do is the second step that you do is you place dummy cells, dummy cells and dummy word line on either side. So we have these dummy cells shown in shaded form here on two sides, and we have this dummy word lines WDB and WDA on the two sides. So why I have shown like this? I mean, this is A side, but here the dummy word line has been named like DY so because the dummy word line WDB and that cell on the in part A helps to create reference for part B. Let us look at how this reference is being provided. So first what we do is similar to the read operation, we pre-charge both parts that is BLA and BLB to be by 2. Then the second thing that we do is we also you know bootstrap this WDB and your WDA. So once this is bootstrapped, what happens is this VDD by 2 or your capacitances in this in these two cells in your dummy cells they are precharged to VDD by 2, right? This is what will happen. It's kind of you know writing operation for these two dummy cells. Now, once this is done, the word lines are again asserted back. I mean, this WDB and WDA, the dummy cell word lines are again put to ground. And now the regular read operation of the DRAM array. Now the regular read operation is performed. So what I mean by regular read operation? Let's say your WA0 or this cell has to be read. So you will, what will you do? This is already pre-charged to VDD by 2. You will just assert this WA0 high. However, once you are doing this at the same time, We also assert the dummy cell or the dummy word line on the other part as high. So for WA0, what is the dummy on the other part? It's WDA. So we also assert WDA high. What this does is if you look at this cell over here, the dummy cell over here. So the dummy cell for this dummy cell, let's call that this is your, you know, uh, the CS of the dummy cell. And this is your transistor of the dummy cell. And this is, let's say, your bit line, bit line B. So your bit line B is kind of pre-charged to be read by 2. Your dummy cell is also pre-charged to be read by 2. So if you're turning on this WDA, this is kind of connected. So this kind of makes sure, I mean, the connection between this CS and CS, which is pre-charged to WL, uh, CS, which is pre-charged to BDD by 2, and this BLB, which is kind of pre-charged to BDD by 2, this connection kind of ensures that your BLB is fixed at BDD by 2. And also, you know, if there is any coupling because of this word line to bit line coupling, so I'll explain it in the next slide what exactly is this word line to bit line coupling. But because of this word line to bit line coupling, any part of this voltage applied on WA0 is kind of coupled here. The same kind of voltage will be coupled here 
because of you know the bit line to word line coupling here and this coupling kind of voltage will be fed as a common voltage to this differential amplifier so given the impact of the cvwl or cwbl whatever we call it any kind of dc offset that you are introducing because of this word line to bit line coupling and application of voltage or a word line any kind of this uh, kind of dc offset that you are having here will be kind of cancelled because it's been introduced from both sides so it's a common it's a common signal to this differential to this differential sense amplifier right so this is the advantage of this kind of open bit line architecture so what are the advantages first you have this effective bit line capacitance as cvl by 2 so your charge transfer ratio increases second it's like providing you a reference which is not changing third it is also kind of cancelling the noise that are being injected on both these terminals so you kind of come up with a voltage reference which kind of tracks the noise it kind of gives you a fixed reference voltage and it also gives you a higher charge transfer ratio but this thing i mean the cancellation of the common noise is true only when you know the left hand side and the right hand side are matched are perfectly matched that is when you will see that you will say that c cwbl on part a is equals to cwbl on part b and you know the voltages that you are applying across or uh, the changes that you will have or the noise sources that you have on the right hand side are exactly same as that on the left hand side however on a chip these two like if this is a big chip these two bit lines are placed far apart from each other right these two parts basically these two parts of a bit line are placed far apart from each other so as the physical distance on a chip increases your variation increases so we can't ensure if they are placed on two sides of the sense amplifier and they are placed far apart we cannot ensure that they are properly matched so to have a proper matching we go for what is known as a folded bit line configuration but before we discuss in detail what exactly is a folded bit line architecture let us see why exactly there is this bit line to word line or word line to bit line coupling so if you look at the array kind of architecture so you have these bit lines going like this and let us draw the word lines like this so you have these word lines going like this right so let's say this is word line 0 word line 1 this is word line 2 similarly let us call that this is bit line 0 bit line 1 bit line 2 and bit line 3 and let us also introduce the cells here so how are these cells connected so you have word line connected to one cell and you have one bit line right cells are connected like this so these would be your cells okay that is fine now this is what you look from top i mean this is what you have in uh, like when you are making the schematic however by looking at the layouts let us say that this is our metal one with which we are routing the bit lines and let us say that we are routing our word lines with metal two so as i discussed earlier their directions of you know routing would be perpendicular to each other so here i have shown it like this so let's say we are routing it like this so this is our let's call this one bit line this call this let's call this second bit line let's call this third bit line so let us call this as bl0 this is bl1 this is bl2 and then what would be there on top of this there would be a interlayer directly so the entire thing would be covered with a ild and then on top of this we would be routing this 
word ranks. So this would be metal two. And let us call this word line zero. This would be word line one, and so on. So if you look at its cross section, you will see that at the bottom you will have these bit lines. So these would be kind of coming out of the paper or going into the plane. So these are your, let's say, your bit lines. This is BL zero. This is BL one. This is BL two. Then on top of this, you have this interlayer dielectric, which is kind of uniformly placed. Then you have this interlayer dielectric on top of this, which is IID. And then on top of this, you have different word lines going along this direction. So word lines are going along this direction. Let's call this is WL zero. WL one and WL two L two will be kind of behind this, since we are looking only at the cross section. So what is the main source of this? Why we have this CWBL? Leads to this CWBL is. You have these bit line zero, bit line one, and bit line two electrodes, and you have this WL zero electrode, and you have an insulator between them. So you have the capacity coupling here, you have capacity coupling here, and you have capacity coupling here. So because of these parasitic coupling through your interlayer dielectric, you have this CWBL, and it is inevitable. So you cannot avoid it because this is the way you have to route it in a circuit, right? Now that we know the origin of this word line to bit line coupling, let us look at the folded bit line architecture, which we discussed earlier. That here, you know, you'll have a more kind of matching between the right hand side and the left hand side. So here, what we do is instead of having those two on different sides of sense amplifiers, I mean, in open bit line, you have this part A and part B on different sides of sense amplifier. What we do is we kind of fold it and bring it on the front end itself. So you bring the part view on the front end itself. So you can see that you have CVLA, CVL bar. So this kind of represents your first part. This kind of represents your second part. You can see that both parts A and B are on the same side of your sense amplifier. So if they are on the same side, you know your physical distance between them is less. Is low physical distance. Uh, sorry, it's less. And a less physical distance implies better matching, better matching, or less variability. So this way we will ensure. That the noise that is present in this terminal is same as the noise which is present in this terminal, and as such, there would this would be more immune to noise, or you know your uh, word line to bit line coupling thing, because your CWBLs would be matched, your interconnect parasitics would also be kind of matched, better matched than your open bit line architecture. So because of these things, you know, this performs better in terms of noise immunity. However, if you look at the disadvantage of this structure, earlier we saw that length of this BL was divided into two halves. For open bit line, which led to your CBL of part A and B. Equals to CBL by two, but in this case, what you have is in order to accommodate all the cells of you know part A and part B, your length of this bit line of part A becomes equal to length of bit line of part B, and it becomes equal to the original bit line length. So now CBL becomes equals to CBL B, and it remains equal to the original bit line capacitance that you had. If you did not divide it into two parts, or you know, if you did not have this open bit line architecture, so this way, you know, you lose 
the advantage of having a lower bitlane capacitance and having a higher charge transfer ratio. But this noise immunity is something which is really important. Now to understand why exactly this noise immunity is important, let us look at the conventional way of arranging these arrays instead of this open bit line or folded bit line. So in conventional way, we have these bit lines and we have these road lines which are going like perpendicular to each other. Here also we'll have this word line to bit line coupling which is, which is represented by these capacitors in green color. These blacks are kind of the DRAM cells that we have. And we have these bit line capacitances like CPL0, CPL1, CPL2 and all. So now, if we assert word line high, if we assert any word line high, or if we change voltage across any word line because of this CWBL, which is kind of between all these word lines and bit lines, there would be a corresponding change in bit line voltage as well. So, how much would be that disturbance? So, if you're WL, let's say, is changing by del V of WL, or the voltage on the WL is swinging by del V of WL. The kind of swing that you, or the charge disturbance that you will see, would be similar to del WVL into C this WBL divided by CWBL plus this CBL. So this will be the kind of charge disturbance. On what? On bit lines because of this. This would be small, you know, because your CBL is large as compared to CWBL, but still there would be a charge disturbance. Now, the worst part is that, you know, this also depends on the data pattern, the pattern of the data which is stored in these cells, and also let's say on the pattern of the data which these bit lines are reading. So, let's say this bit line 0 is reading a 0. Let's say this is reading as logic 0, this is also reading a logic 0. Some cell is the current is reading logic 0. This is, let's say, reading a logic 1, this is reading logic 0, and this is also reading logic 0. Okay, now since these are all like most of the cells are reading logic 0, most bit lines, so bit lines are read in parallel to kind of you know get all the words together or get one word together, whatever it is. So bit lines are read to be in read in parallel. So let's see most of the bit, let's say most of the bit lines are kind of sensing zero. So most of the bit lines, on most of the bit lines, your voltages would be changing from VDD by 2 or it would be re reducing, right? So your V of VL would be negative. It would be reducing from VDD by 2, so del VVL would be negative. Now this change in the bit line or this change in the bit line would be coupled to this word line also. I mean, if this voltage is reducing, this would be coupled to this word line. Similarly, it will be coupled to this word line through here, through here as well. There will be this CW, CBWL through here as well. So because of this, what would happen is effectively your word lines, which were floating terminals, would be discharged here, but it can be charged or discharged depending upon the pattern of data which is being read. Now, if they are discharging, they can also extract some amount of charge from this bit line to which is kind of sensing a one. So if most of the bit lines are sensing 
zero due to this word line to bit line coupling first your floating word line may be discharged second it may also you know extract some charge from bit line which is reading one so if it is reading one its voltage should have increased from vdd by 2 to let's say some positive value more than vdd by 2 so here your del vbl would have been positive but now since this bit since this word line is kind of extracting charges from here so this effective uh, kind of voltage that this bit line will see would be less than this vdd by 2 so this can also lead to erroneous results and the worst part is this is pattern dependent this is pattern dependent so to understand this is taking just a small sample of this overall array and then understanding it so let me draw that so you have this word line over here let's call this word line zero and let me also draw two bit lines so let's say this is bit line this cbl is zero and this is let's say cbl 3 line or cbl 2 so here it was cbl 2 which was kind of sensing one so let me draw cbl 2 and then there are these two parasitic capacitors cwbl and here also we have this cbl and we say that you know the cbl0 is kind of sensing a zero and the cbl1 is going to sense a one now since this cbl0 is sensing a zero it is being discharged so since it is being discharged it may try to extract because of this parasitic coupling it may try to extract charges from cwbl which in turn may try to extract these charges from this cwbl like this and which in turn may extract charges from the cbl2 so this can be your discharging path similarly if you have multiple such bit lines like let's say you have multiple such bit lines over here which are kind of you know sensing a zero there could be other discharging paths as well so what may end up happening is it may end up leading to a incorrect read of this bl2 so just to avoid this kind of a situation we use this folded bit line or open bit line configuration okay. now another implication of this discharging of bit line sensing one due to other bit lines sensing zero owing to this capacitive coupling is that your cbl is also capacitively coupled to your cs which is your capacitive multi one sensor so if your cbl is kind of discharging it may also extract charges from your capacitance of the cell and once this capacitance of the cell is extracted or once the charges are extracted from the cell capacitance this also may disturb whatever data was written earlier into the cell phenomenon also leads to what is known as the row hamming effect so in row hamming effect what happens is let us draw first our crossbar array of this d ramps these are sorry so these are let's say word lines so word lines here then line 1 then line 2 and let's draw the bit lines now let's say these are the bit lines Let's say this is bit line zero, bit line one, bit line two, bit line three, 
there is also two other cells. So at each of these intersections, you would have these DRAM cells. Okay, so in row hammering, what exactly happens is people hammer a row. By hammering, what I mean is the kind of you know read this row multiple times continuously. without any refresh. How can we do that? Let's say if our refresh cycle of the ref or the refresh time is let's say 0.1 milliseconds, if that is the refresh time, we access this row, let's say some median number of times, within this 0 0.1 millisecond. So once we do that, we already know that this read process is destructive. So we'll kind of, you know, discharge or, you know, we'll kind of change altogether the content of these cells during this row hammering event. However, what also happens is because they, these are also kind of coupled, so because you also have these coupling capacitances, Content of even the neighboring cells, like content of even cells on top or cells at the bottom, like if we have cells like this. So the content of even these cells, so content of even neighboring cells may be flipped. Why it can, it can be flipped? Because of this capacity coupling. Because of coupling. So that is kind of very dangerous and this kind of row hammering attacks are very common nowadays. So apart from this, we also have something which is important which is called this soft error. So what happens in software arrays, all these packaging materials, you know, the packaging materials of your ICs, they contain traces of radioactive elements. And whenever you have these radioactive elements, you have this decay radioactive decay and because of decay you have these alpha particles now whenever you have these alpha particles they'll impinge upon semiconductor and then they'll lead to electron hole pair generation ehp generation so because of this generation of electron and hole pairs what may happen is your load capacitor or the uh, charge on this cs cs charge may be disturbed and this we call as soft error. Now let us look at another difference between you know your SLAM and DRAM which is based on your input output interfacing. So we know that we have row decoders and column decoders which kind of you know select a particular bit or word depending upon the type of architecture if we have bit addressability or word addressability. Now in SRAMs what happens is in a SRAM chip for instance there would be several pins right. So in SRAM chip 
the number of address pins is same as the number of bits required for row plus column decoder so to access one particular bit you provide whole row plus column address at the same time to your pins address pins and then you can read it however this is not the case with dramps so for dram the manufacturers tend to save cost tend to save cost by minimizing pins for this address so how they do it so in your dra you only have half the number of pins so what they employ is a time domain multiplexing so how they do it is first let's say it's a total let's say total address is 16 bit long so out of that 16 bit long address let's say msd represents your row address 8 bit msd represents your row address and 8 bit of the from lsd the 8 bit represent your column address i mean the first 8 bits from msp represent the row address and the four, and the last 8 bits towards the lsp represent your column address so if it were a sram so it if it were a sram let me write it with black if it were a sram you would have 16 pins but in dram you only have 8 pins so how dram manages it so when you employ the first 8 bits msb from the msb that is a row address you have something which is called ras row access stroke so you kind of enable or you kind of tell your uh, like chip that okay now the row addresses are here and you have to read it and now you have to actually select a particular row depending upon this address so this row access stroke is given like that. for the last 8 bits from lsd which represents a column address we have something which is called cs or column access stroke so once this row access stroke is done the next 8 bits are kind of presented on the same pin and then column access stroke is kind of activated so if you look at the timing diagram let us say this is your address this is your ras and this is your cas so if the first 8 bits are kind of placed here then ras will turn high here and it will say that okay now you have to read the 8 bits now once this is done your cas like let's say you have again your 8 bits which is kind of your column address bits so the cs will turn on here and it will say that now you have to read these last 8 bits using the same pin so using your 8 bit pin like using your so now using 8 pins itself we kind of make this dram chip work because of this time domain multiplexing and this is how they tend to save cost 
So this is also one of the differences between I/O interfacing when doing it with DRAM and when doing it with SRAM. 